Um, we talked about financial services, we talked about Monte Carlo sampling, talked about traffic optimization problems. Next, to kind of maybe close the, to, to kind of close the circle, we will talk about sustainability uh, as a key issue today, obviously. And here as well, quantum computing can help. Um, and in this talk, this will be about complex molecules and computational chemistry and how we can apply quantum computing to um, to improve uh, carbon capture, uh, to improve uh, materials that, carb uh, that capture carbon. For that, I have Dr. Maud Einhorn with, uh, with us, who is a technical solution specialist with Continuum. Maud, thanks for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I hope that you can all see my slides. You can. So, uh, yes, I am Maud Einhorn. I'm, I'm a technical solution specialist working at Continuum. And I'm going to be speaking today about how we can attempt to model carbon capture on metal organic frameworks using quantum computing and kind of trying to frame this in, in an industrial sense and why this is an important problem for industry. Um, so as an agenda, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to Continuum as a company and what the work we do, um, why we wanted to look at carbon capture and why that's an important problem, um, an introduction to quantum chemistry to try and get everyone on the same page, and then go into how we attempted to model carbon capture on um, metal organic frameworks. Um, and this was done in collaboration with Total Energies. So yeah, as some context, at the end of last year, Cambridge Quantum merged with Honeywell Quantum Solutions um, to kind of born Continuum. Um, and the aim here was to bring together some of the most powerful quantum computing software expertise with Honey uh, Honeywell Quantum Solutions hardware expertise to become a kind of global full stack quantum computing company. Um, we have offices all over the world, um, including in Munich, um, London and Cambridge, the United States, Japan, and we're opening one in France as well. And science is at the forefront of what we do with the vast majority of our company working as research scientists and engineers, um, working across hardware and software applications um, in kind of cyber, machine learning, quantum Monte Carlo, and also chemistry, which is what I'm going to be speaking about today. So in terms of the motivation for this work, as we all know, CO2 emissions have been increasing very rapidly over the past 100 or so years. Um, and in fact, 34 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide was emitted into the atmosphere in 2020, um, which is obviously a massive amount and is a huge problem um, in our lifetime at the moment. With um, many governments and corporations have now pledged to reduce CO2 emissions, there's been a huge influx of research into both new renewable energy technologies, and also alternative methods um, such as carbon capture and sequestration. Um, so on a practical level, the aim with um, carbon capture technologies is that you can prevent the CO2 from entering the atmosphere by capturing it directly from industrial processes using a carbon capture material. This CO2 can then be utilized in industries such as in kind of fuel and power generation or construction, or on a larger scale, um, can be stored long term within these materials kind of deep in the earth. And so this really helps in terms of our climate change goals, essentially. There's a clearly a very um, compelling environmental and human case for investing in this technology, as well as a business case if it can be done cheaply and effectively. And so that's one of the key issues at the moment is that the process historically has been too expensive to be economically viable on a large scale. And new materials are needed, which are cheap to produce, are also chemically stable and have a high storage capacity. So moving on to kind of quantum chemistry, it's this is a key method which is used in materials discovery at the moment. And the aim here is to kind of simulate the properties of a material as accurately as possible without having to rely on lab experiments. Um, and these experimental R&D cycles can be very costly and slow. So we can use computational modeling to guide experiment towards a new material, and this can be extremely beneficial. Um, one of the key issues with computational methods using classical computers um, is that the computational cost of these quantum chemistry methods scales extremely badly in terms of your system size. So what we find is that the most accurate methods are limited to us calculating extremely small systems. And as we go to larger system sizes, we suffer quite a significant reduction in accuracy in terms of our results. And this is really problematic when we want to look at these kind of slightly more complex materials. 
quantum computers have actually been looked to as a really important new paradigm in terms of quantum chemistry. So this takes advantage of the fact that we want to calculate quantum systems using a similarly quantum device. And there's a whole host of benefits that are offered with that. And this gives us the potential to allow us to calculate much larger systems with higher accuracy than is currently possible with methods today, which are done on classical machines, such as density functional theory. Currently using um, NIST devices, we're able to approach um, the chemical accuracy that is given by coupled cluster methods, but we can't really surpass that at the moment. However, in the future with fault tolerant devices, there's a real hope that we should be able to surpass what is achievable classically um, using quantum devices for larger system sizes um, and also for some types of materials which are known to systematically fail with classical quantum chemistry methods. Um, however, using today's uh, quantum computers for chemistry applications is really challenging for multiple reasons. So firstly, um, the field is advancing incredibly rapidly. So there are both numerous algorithms to choose from, as well as several different devices and backends which you can choose from as well. Um, and trying to optimize that and test different algorithms can be really challenging if you have to rewrite um, your circuits every single time. Typically, we're also limited to calculating small atomic or molecular systems, which makes it really challenging when we want to look at systems of industrial relevance, which might be larger and more complicated. Um, and it's also hard for us to get accurate results at all using today's noisy devices. So at Continuum, we tried to tackle some of these problems and developed a computational chemistry software platform, which allows a computational chemist to experiment with a range of different quantum algorithms for chemistry that can be run on NISC devices. Um, importantly, we tried to develop some methods for breaking down large molecules, um, such as these embedding methods, which I'll mention later, as well as noise mitigation procedures. So this means we can calculate actually industrially relevant systems on today's noisy devices. Um, this whole package was kind of developed in collaboration with industry partners, including Total Energies, Roche and Nippon Steel. Um, and we've applied it to a range of different problems, including solid crystalline materials, drug molecules, and complex nanomaterials, like the ones I'm gonna be speaking about today. And this was a really mutually beneficial way of working because it meant we could really hone in on what industry is looking for in this space and um, details of all of those collaborations are outlined in these publications, which are on archive. So yeah, the rest of this presentation will kind of be speaking about this work with Total Energies, which was looking at modeling uh, CO2 capture on metal organic frameworks. And um, Total Energies is obviously known for being a global energy producer and provider and has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's actively pursuing um, research in a range of different technologies in this space, including in um, carbon capture and sequestration. As a company, they've also been involved in the quantum computing initiative since 2019, and so have an active interest in quantum in-house. And for this project, they were really interested in looking at modeling metal organic frameworks, which have a structure like the one that's shown um, in this figure here, to be looked at for carbon capture technologies. Um, and these are highly porous nanostructures where gases such as hydrogen or CO2 can actually become trapped within these pores um, and stored for quite a long period of time. Aluminium-based metal organic frameworks in particular offer some really key benefits in terms of being um, very stable in terms of hydrothermal stability and having very easy synthesis. So their chemistry um, is, should be really beneficial for this carbon capture technology, but is actually quite poorly understood at the moment because they're quite complex to model on an atomic level. In terms of the business case for this, 70% of the costs of carbon capture technologies um, come down to the capture element of it. Um, and so it's really necessary that we find new materials which are both efficient and cheap to produce and accurate modeling is needed to help in the development of these new materials, particularly in terms of understanding the interaction of what these local metal clusters, which make up the framework of this structure, what the interaction is between those and the gas molecules that are coming in. Um, and importantly, this is kind of on the boundary of what is even able to be done classically. And so it's a really good case for quantum computing. 
So just looking at the complexity of these structures, we can see that this is quite a significant undertaking. Um, and as I said, they present a nice problem in that they cannot be simulated accurately using first principles quantum chemistry methods on classical machines at the moment. And this is due to their size. So a key objective for this project was how do we begin to go about simulating a system as complex as this and the gas sorption mechanisms that are so important to the carbon capture? And how can we do this on NISC devices and simulators? And this is a really key step in terms of quant kind of using quantum technologies for materials design and optimization. So in terms of our model, we chose the aluminium fumarate model, which is shown here. And this was picked as a representative model for the larger moth structure. Um, this was chosen because it's known to be a building block, which is found in water stable moth structures already. So we know that this makes up the framework and we're going to use this to kind of simulate what these interactions are going to be. We want to um, model the key interaction of this metal site with an incoming CO2 molecule and um, moving forwards, try and understand how that governs the carbon capture capabilities. So in terms of the workflow, what we can see is we've gone from this very large extended structure down to one of the building blocks, but this molecule is still too large to be able to um, simulate on today's quantum um, simulators. So we utilize a novel fragmentation approach, which is based on density matrix embedding theory or DMAT. Um, and this method is something that's known um, and is kind of based off a method that's used classically at the moment. And essentially we break down the molecule into fragments, which are then able to be treated separately um, using whatever levels of theory that you want. Um, and this is really key in terms of us starting to calculate these very large and industrially relevant systems with quantum algorithms today. In particular, we're interested in calculating what our CO2 absorption mechanism is. So we want to calculate this active site using a quantum algorithm and the rest of the non-active component of the molecule we can actually look at using lower cost classical computational chemistry methods without suffering a significant reduction in terms of the accuracy of our result. What's really exciting is that this approach can be applied to other materials such as pharmaceutical molecules, which in, in a similar way might have a very important active site um, and the rest of the molecule actually be non-active in terms of its behavior. So if you can model that active site using a quantum algorithm, the rest of the site you can model, the rest of the molecule you can model classically. Um, so this was really key in terms of method development. Um, we started out by testing multiple fragmentation strategies and found that using a larger fragment for our non-active component of our molecule um, gave us more accurate results in terms of our total energy of our molecule. So at the top here, we have our aluminium fumarate molecule, and we've got the non-active component of our molecule and the CO2. So that's these two parts here, which were treated um, using classical methods, um, restricted heart tree FOC on, run on a classical machine. And then the active aluminium site was treated with UCCSD on a quantum simulator. Using this, we calculated our bond dissociation energy as a function of our aluminium and CO2 distance here. Um, and this was calculated for a range of different active space sizes, ranging from four qubits to 16 qubits. And then we compared that to our full um, space classical calculation, which is shown here in green. What we can see is that our bond association um, occurs at two angstroms in every single case. And our bond association energy uh, or our binding energy matched our classical results to within chemical accuracy. Um, this is really key in terms of validating our approach um, and kind of, yeah, essentially validating this hybrid classical quantum approach to these systems. This also means that um, quantum computing methodologies have reached a stage where they can actually match what we're getting from our state of the art classical methods for studying these types of systems using this approach. And this is a really key objective in terms of modeling them on NISC devices. Going forward, um, we've scaled the problem so that it can be expanded to look at the adsorbate interaction using the same methodology. So as quantum technology becomes more mature and we've got more qubits to play around with, we can expand this active space to include more of the molecule using exactly the same methodology as we've developed at the moment. 
So to conclude, um, what I've tried to put across in this talk is that firstly, quantum computing is rapidly advancing. And this is really mirrored in terms of the levels of investment and engagement we're seeing from industry um, in exploring quantum computing in this space. Um, I've tried to show that we can approach tackling one or how we can approach tackling one of these problems um, with an industrial partner. And importantly, in terms of chemistry, show that we've reached a point where we can begin to study industrially relevant systems and get accurate results using suitably scaled models on today's devices and simulators. Um, and that all of these problems should be kind of phased in a way that they can be scaled up in the future with the advancement of technology. Um, yeah, so that concludes my talk. All of the publications referenced um, can be found here. And um, thank you all for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, Ms. Einhorn, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you for sharing uh, your experiences with uh, modeling these kind of, uh, these kind of applications. Um, let me ask a few questions maybe because we have around three minutes left and we want to make sure we use them. Um, maybe question one. Um, what, what is the biggest challenge you're working on right now in this concrete uh, application? What is there that you maybe still want to solve? What is the next step in this, in this journey, looking at these specific types of material and modeling uh, carbon and carbon capture there? Yeah, so, well, in general, as I said, one of the biggest problems is that these systems are so complicated that a lot of their interactions just can't be modeled effectively using classical computational chemistry methods. So we've taken the first step to try and simulate just the active site in the system using a quantum algorithm. The next stage would be trying to expand this space to include the CO2 molecule and a larger part of the framework. And so we're hoping that in kind of in the future, we can expand that quite simply because we've got the methodology there. So this kind of forms as a really good proof of concept that our methodology works as a starting point. I see. Got it. Cool. That sounds very promising. Also, that you can just then, then scale it kind of to, to other to other areas. I think that's a, that's a very valuable thing. Um, other question, maybe that's a bit more more philosophical, but maybe it's, it's relevant as well. Um, if there was one thing that you would that people could take away from your talk today, if there was one thing that uh, they could be doing now after they, they switch off their their device later, um, what would it be? Also, maybe relating to uh, to your thoughts and what your your experiences doing this kind of work um i think well i think one of the most important things is for all of this research to come together there kind of needs to be buy-in both on a personal level and also on an industrial level and on a governmental level and i think that's one of the things that kind of comes into doing this research i think as much as people should be taking personal responsibility for sustainability you also need to be tackling these problems with industry you need to be tackling these problems with governments and kind of quantum computing could be a way that we can start looking at these really new emerging technologies but it needs to also have industry buy-in at the same time so that's kind of the way that we've been trying to approach all of these problems Super interesting. I think this this more kind of uh, also global approach, multi-layered approach uh, makes sense. It's a complex issue indeed. Yeah, nothing works uh, in isolation. It all yeah. has to work together, I think. I see. Maybe you, there's time for one last question. There's a word I wrote down before because uh, I didn't know it. What would you say to so-called naysayers who say that this is maybe not the right way to go when it comes to applying quantum computing to these kind of issues? Um. Well, I don't know. I think at the moment, with a technology that is as cutting edge as this, I don't think there's, we don't know what the right way is to to kind of approach all of these problems. I think what we're, what's really key now is doing these proof of concepts and trying to work out, firstly, where we can find, potentially find quantum advantage in the future, and also estimate the resources that might be required for that. And I think unless you explore as many areas as possible, we're never going to be able to um, understand that. So I think at the moment it's important for us to try and tackle as many problems as possible and see where the advantage could lie in the future rather than limiting ourselves at this point. Thank you. I think that's, that's, that's a great spirit. Thank you so much for being with us today, for giving an insight into what you are working on, um, Ms. Icon. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference um, and hope to see, you, uh, to see you again soon next time, maybe next year. Thank you so much.